This is CBC Here and Now. My foot went that way 40 feet, my ankle went that way 30 feet. But that hasn't slowed Jason Lingard down. Me too. Facebook lights up with tales of sexual harassment in wake of Weinstein. I might as well use them to the good. This 79-year-old reveals her secret in running Cape to Cabot in record time. Well, temperatures into the teens, even some 20s today. But get ready to break out the warm jackets once again as temperatures tumble tonight into Tuesday. We begin this evening with some disturbing numbers about sexual assault in this province. The number of people seeking help from the sexual assault crisis line increased dramatically this year. Here now is Carolyn Stokes joins us now live. Carolyn, just how bad are these numbers? Well, Anthony, uh, the Sexual Assault Crisis and Prevention Centre has never received so many calls from people they describe as in crisis. Now, those are the most serious calls, emergencies, people who need immediate medical attention, people in dangerous situations, or people who are suicidal. Now, so far this year, the centre has received 748 crisis calls, and there are still about two months left in 2017. So compare that to last year when 587 crisis calls calls came into their helpline. That's a difference of 161. And I'm told several more crisis calls have come in throughout today. That's the highest number in the center's 40 years. So that's alarming for program director Janet Lee, but she is pointing out there could be many reasons for this increase. There could be more incidents of sexual violence or more people may be seeking out help. It's hard to know for sure, but Lee hopes the latter is true. It's my hope that, that more people feel comfortable reaching out. A lot of the calls that we're receiving are really about exploring a lot of the self-blame, guilt and shame that people feel. And I think a lot of that comes from, from so many messages that, that folks are feeling like we know here at the Centre that if you've been impacted by sexual violence, if you've experienced sexual violence, it absolutely is not your fault. And I think that that is a message that can't be shared enough. And that is one of the messages being shared on social media in a big way right now. Over the weekend, hashtag MeToo exploded on social media. Women have experienced sexual harassment or assault started using that hashtag to show how widespread the problem is and to show other victims that they're not alone. All right, Carolyn, thank you very much. Thank you. And in about 30 minutes, Debbie has an interview about the MeToo campaign that sparked a lot of local reaction here. Turning now to a sports news story, St. John's new pro basketball team introduced itself to its target audience today. A gym full of students clapped and cheered at McDonald Drive Junior High today as the team unveiled its logo, jersey and name, the St. John's Edge. Here now, Zach Gowdy has reaction from the young fans and a big rumor about a homegrown star the team would just love to sign. Pretty cool, and like the way that they made the logo is pretty interesting. So I really like it. It's really cool. I think it's a really good idea. Really good idea, yeah. What do you like most about it? Uh, I have to say the colors. I think it represents Newfoundland really well. The difference with basketball or marketing basketball is it probably is to a younger demographic than uh, hockey. We think that it's a growth sport. Uh, we th we think that the kids relate to basketball. Uh, lots of kids are playing basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport, so it's better than a hockey team. Better than a hockey team? Yeah. I don't know, it's more fun and there's a lot more scoring in it. Are young people as interested in basketball as people were in, in hockey before? In junior high and high school, they're very much so interested. It's a really popular sport now. Yeah. And if we can get the roster the way I want it for the start of the season, we got a chance to be pretty good. So do you want Carl English on that uh, roster? Uh, uh, you know, that is certainly a name that has been thrown out there. I have not met him. I hope I get a chance to talk to him while I'm here. And I know that would be somebody that uh, this community would love to have on the team without question. And so would I. Uh, but he certainly has opportunities elsewhere too. So he's got to weigh it out and figure it out. But who knows? We'll see. There's hope tonight for landlords and tenants grappling with rental problems. The minister responsible for the Residential Tenancies Act says changes are coming. 
Here now is Arianna Kellen was at the House of Assembly today and she joins us now live from our newsroom. Arianna, you spoke with Sherry Gambin Walsh. What did she tell you? Well, she did commit to making changes to the controversial Residential Tenancies Act, which sets out rules for landlords and tenants when there's a dispute. Now, this news comes after a series of CBC stories looking at the challenges faced by both landlords and tenants. Just last week, we visited a property in St. John's that had over $10,000 worth of damage. Now, in that case, both the top and bottom floor apartments were trashed, and the landlords felt that the Residential Tenancies Act wasn't much much help, especially because it took months to get those tenants out. Now, the minister did not give any information on what the amendments will focus on, but was clear about the challenges. The biggest challenge is actually the complex relationship between the tenants and the landlords. And the Residential Tenancies Act is there to protect the rights of both tenants and landlords. So we have to have a balance in this act. And we have to ensure that whatever we, amendments we put forward protect and are in the best interest of both the tenants and the landlords. That is a challenge. Now, the Liberals have changed their tune on this issue. Just last April, then Service NL Minister Perry Trimper said the government would have to do a full new review first instead of using a review completed by the Tories in 2012. But Gambin Walsh now says they have used that PC review in addition with other consultations and are ready to move forward. Now, the latest that these amendments can be debated will be during the spring sitting of the House of Assembly. But until then, landlords and renters are left with the status quo. Debbie. Thanks very much to Arianna Kelland. Well, government is facing resistance tonight in changing the rules about how elections are run. The changes are needed before a by-election to replace Steve Kent in Mount Pearl North is called. The House was called earlier than usual to debate the changes, but the PCs and NDP would not allow the rules to quickly pass. The existing rules for special ballots were struck down by a court. Now, the changes would make campaigns longer, at least 26 instead of 21 days, with no limit to how long a campaign could be. You will no longer be able to vote by special ballot before the election is called. You'll have to wait until candidates are nominated. Once the election is called, parties will have just five days to get all the candidates in place. And it's that tight timeline that has opposition parties concerned. That's an extremely short period of time. Right across the country, the period is, is longer than that. So uh, what I would like to see is that we have 10 days up front. Having, a, having some of the rules you have in place on five days and an unlimited writ period, benefits to governing party. We have a significant concern about that. I know the minister mentioned today they've been consulting with experts in constitution. Well, I'd like to know who, he's, who his experts are so we can talk to him as well. We had such a beautiful weekend in St. John's. It was a bit of a shocker to wake mm -hmm. to this news at a Labrador West. I mean, it's quite something, Snow, right? Oh, 10 yeah. centimeters. 10 centimeters in Lab West, even five centimeters in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So a little taste of, uh, of snow Ooh. for everybody overnight. Uh, some of the scenes, if you're not a fan of winter, are Frightening, scary. Have a look. Uh, <laughs> this is a great couple of pictures here from Jackie Lushman. And you can see, yeah, quite terrifying indeed, especially if you're not a fan of winter. Uh, but you know what? Not uncommon for this time of year to see at, uh, shots of snow like this, 5 to 10 centimeters. And the Halloween decorations certainly covered up there in western parts of Labrador. Now, as we look at the last uh, six hours or last 12 hours or so, uh, look at temperatures this morning at 9 a.m. We are into the teens across the island, 16, 17, 18 degrees in Cornerbrook. Watch as the cold front has moved through across the island through the day. Single digits in Cornerbrook by 3 o'clock this afternoon. We're now into the single digits in Central, just 6 in Gander after a high of 20 earlier. And yeah, that uh, colder air will continue to funnel in tonight. We're looking at clearing skies uh, in terms of those showers tapering off. But by the time we get to tomorrow morning, showers moving back in for St. John's, the Avalon, the southeast, chances of showers across the west. A pretty quiet start to the day in Labrador. We'll uh, have a look at what your Tuesday, Wednesday is shaping up uh, in terms of those temperatures. A little uh, uh, spoiler alert, you're going to want the coat. We'll break down the forecast in full detail in just a few minutes. On tomorrow's show, the province is about to lose some fish plant work. It's a sector where every job counts. 
it's going to have a very negative impact on our economy and not only Grand Bank, but all the Bjorn Peninsula. Helping Aboriginal people by taking away fish jobs here? Is it just? Tomorrow on Here and Now. Cornerbrook's new mayor says he's going to improve the West Coast city through business. That's the message Jim Parsons delivered to the city's Board of Trade today. Here now is Colleen Connors is covering that story tonight and she's live with us from Cornerbrook. Colleen? Well, Jim Parsons says he's focusing on the business side of things, and that's what he knows best. He's a business owner in Cornerbrook. He's the former chair of the Downtown Business Association. And when he was running for mayor, his campaign focused a lot on the business and improving business in Cornerbrook. Now, of course, he does have many other things he has planned for the city as the new mayor. But the top priorities are focusing on business relations and, of course, in growing the population here in Cornerbrook at the Cornerbrook Board of Trade luncheon saying people need jobs to pay taxes and live a better life. He says the existence of Cornerbrook as a community is dependent on the city's ability to build new business and of course hopefully attract some young families to come and live here. Parsons says the perception in Cornerbrook is that it's difficult to do business here. That City Hall, you know, they don't just approve permits, they don't approve them fast enough, and there's a lot of red tape involved. He wants to change that perception, and he says doing that starts with working much more closely with the staff at City Hall to get, you know, all that paper trail moving. I think that there's a lot of patience. Everyone understands there's regulations. They understand there's building codes. But uh, we need to do a better job of being out front with those things and uh, making sure everyone's on the same page. Let us take that responsibility and not just leave it in the hands of the, the developer of the business. So the question is, you know, how is he going to improve the business dealings with the city? So one big example, of course, is tonight is his first public council meeting, starts in just a few minutes, and this is his first meeting as the, the mayor, and so the council has plans of putting together this new development application right to council. So they've kind of skipped over some technical briefing committees and more extra meetings. They're putting this forward to council tonight, hoping to kind of speed up the process, possibly get a quick resolution, and get some business moving a little bit faster. Live in Cornerbrook, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. To Natwashish now, where there's a police investigation into the sudden death of a teenager. The 17-year-old girl was found dead at a home in the community on Friday. There's no word on what happened, but an autopsy had been scheduled for today. Police are asking anyone with information about her death to contact them. The man accused in the death of 88-year-old Regula Shuley will stand trial for first-degree murder. Jonathan Henock was initially charged with second-degree murder in the Happy Valley Goose Bay woman's death. However, Judge Phyllis Harris ruled in provincial court today that the charges be upgraded to first-degree murder. The decision comes after evidence was given in the preliminary inquiry, which is under a publication ban. Other charges against Henock include break and entry with intent, robbery with violence, and arson endangering human life. Shuley was found unresponsive in her home during a fire on July 24, 2016. A date has been set for a peace bond hearing against a man once accused of being the so-called Halifax sleep watcher. Barry Sinclair now lives in St. John's. He was found not guilty of being the sleep watcher five years ago. But he has a long criminal record that includes five federal prison terms. Sinclair was released from custody in February. The RNC believes he will commit a violent offense against a woman. So the police have gone to court to put him under under a series of conditions to restrict his movements. A hearing has been set for January 5th. Until then, he is under an interim order with conditions aimed at ensuring public safety, according to police. Over 100 members of uniformed services gathered in St. John's on Saturday night for their annual gala. And this year, one aspect of the evening was especially poignant. The gathering was held at CFS St. John's. Police officers, firefighters, paramedics, military personnel, Coast Guard, corrections and sheriff's officers, and fish and wildlife enforcement were all represented. Each year they pay tribute to fallen and absent comrades by setting a single serving at a small table. This table remains empty during the event and everything on it has a special meaning. This year, thoughts and memories of RCMP Corporal Trevor O'Keefe were still vivid following his suicide last month. Retired Staff Sergeant Jim Power said while explaining the significance of the table that it has been a tough year.
дівчини била, вчора мати Тарас. Well, what you're hearing there are Kubasonics, a Ukrainian folk jam band based here in St. John's. Kubasonics were nominated for three Music NL Awards last night, and it was a sweep. The group took home Folk Roots Artist of the Year, Group of the Year, and Entertainer of the Year. Now, they say they're arguably the province's finest Ukrainian band. Not exactly <laughs> sure how much competition they have, but nonetheless, a big congratulations to them. And uh, last night's gala in St. John's uh, wasn't just an awards show. Mm -hmm. It was also a celebration of Music NL's 25th anniversary. Amelia Kern performed along with the Once and Shani Ganok. Everybody. And yeah, great lineup. Kubasonics weren't the only three-time winners. Singer-songwriter Janet Call went in with five nominations, and she snagged awards for Pop Rock Artist of the Year, Album of the Year, and Female Artist of the Year for her record, Real Tough Love. Meanwhile, Steve Maloney took home Country Artist of the Year, Alternative Artist of the Year, and Ron Hines, SoCan Songwriter of the Year. Maloney was nominated for two albums, A Room with a View, which was submitted as part of February's RPM Challenge, and The Memory Game, released in August. Up next, the story of a young father who didn't let a horrific and life-threatening accident get in the way of his future. Getting a feed. Later we'll tell you where these, uh, this pod of Atlantic white-sided dolphins uh, went to find a school of mackerel. Wow.
back to here and now. Freak accidents, random catastrophes that come out of nowhere, they can be real life changers. For Jason Lingard, the horrific way that this man lost his leg 10 years ago could have killed him. He almost bled to death. But not long after the shock finally died down, Jason decided he was not going to let his new handicap slow him down. I went to Bishop's Falls recently to meet with Jason, his two young sons, and Jason's dad. So Jason, tell me where we are and what happened 10 years ago. Uh, this is where I was standing when I hauled a skid out from the basement. And I had it picked up from behind. And my buddy hit the gas th three or four times. And the track busted. And banged my leg or my foot and my ankle off the door. And my foot went that way 40 feet. And my ankle went that way 30 feet. Well, I just looked down and my boot was gone. And I said to Dad, I said, Dad, my leg is, 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 is gone. He said, yeah, he said, it's, it's gone, Dad. Yeah, it's gone. Come on, come on. Come on, girls, come on. Come on, baby, come on. Your son's story about his leg is really quite amazing. Can you tell me what happened to you on that day? That's a day that we don't talk about a lot, I can tell you. But we were doing a barbecue and uh, Jay was doing the uh, carbs on the skidoo. So I uh, helped him do the first two. And I went down then to finish the barbecue. Before I got it finished, they called said it was an accident, Jay was hurt. I went up and I just looked at him and he was holding there, holding a tourniquet on his leg. I pulled it tight. He said, Dad, my leg is screwed. And I said, Dad, Jay, your foot's gone. I couldn't find his foot. And we found it four days later uh, over in the snowbank. Jason ended up in hospital for nine long days. So how did you process this when you were lying there in the hospital bed? Uh, I believe that everything happens for a reason, good and bad. And in your case, what was the reason? Mm, uh, what does it kill you makes you stronger? Uh, it was six months before I could even walk down by his basement. Every time I go near it, I'd cry. But he he did well. He, he, got, he got over it and we built a place here and he's still here. So what was the hardest part of getting over this injury? The hardest part was I had to give up my dirt bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the first thing mom asked me. She said, so how are you feeling? And I woke up from, the, from my surgery and I said, well, mom, I, I got to get rid of my dirt bike. She said, why? She said, you're talking about your dirt bike when you just lost your leg? I said, yeah, I can't kick it over anymore. I have no leg. So I traded it for a golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> For some people, you know, losing a leg in a, in a freak accident like this would be something that would take a very, very long time to get over, but you made some decisions early on, right? Yes. And what were they? Um, I had my little boy that was six and a half months in his mom's belly at the time, and that was one of the things that kept me going. Come on, Simon. Luna. And I couldn't give up because of that. You want to do it first? Luna. So he was, he was what was keeping me going. Come on. I had to be there for him. Come on, bud. Come on. Good girl. What were the first, uh, the first measurements for uh, an artificial leg like? Uh, it was about six months after the accident. I had, had to heal and the swelling had to go down enough so I could get fitted. And then I got my first leg. It was May the 26th. And I started putting siding on a few buildings around here on scaffolding that summer by myself. I love it. How did you adjust to this as you as time went on? Just kept going. Didn't let it stop me at all. Back in the seat again. So you've been through quite a few legs. Tell me about them. Uh, this is one of my first temporary sockets. It's made out of plastic. And it's got a rubber keezy cone inside for comfort. A little low tech. Yep. Number two. <coughs> and. This is the one that's made out of fiberglass. It's the old system, the pin system. And then I went to the suction method. You got the liner that holds the actual leg on. It's all uh, carbon fiber and uh, graphite. So slowly they get better and better, right? Yep. Including the one you have on now? Yes. This one's all fiberglass, or all carbon fiber too as well. It's the Veriflex. As you were getting used to, to being somebody who lost that part of his leg, was there anything that really helped you adjust? I'm determined and stubborn. 
What do you make of the way your son managed to sort of get through all this with the number of legs that he's used? Well, he's too busy, I guess. He's too active, so I guess he's wearing stuff out like faster than normal. Well, he's still working and trying to do what he can. Simon. Hey, girl. Come on. He's got a lot of fortitude. As one dad to another, what was it like to actually see your son in this hor horrible situation? <sighs> if I could have taken the pain, I could have taken it for him, I would have. But it was just, it was a terrible time in our lives. But we pulled through it together, we did, all of us. So why didn't you just sit back on a couch and feel sorry for yourself when this happened? Why? Why would I want to? Well, because it's, it's kind of depressing and miserable to lose a leg. Yeah. It's only a leg. Only a leg. As long as I got these two. You must be proud of him. Yeah, I'm very proud of him. He's my hero. Oh my goodness, yeah, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it what kills me to see that because you know you get these stories and you sort of think I'm making you sort of repeat all these painful memories. But I think his father said that we never talked about it, right? So that's why the emotion was so close to the surface. You can see the father's love, a parent's yeah. love that never goes away. And boy, Jason, you are one tough cookie. <laughs> he, is. he definitely Excellent. is. Excellent. Yeah. Good luck. Up next, we take you to Carboneer and tell you why this special playground was opened on the weekend.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back once again. And before we get to more of the forecast mm -hmm. with Ryan, we have some video to show you. It's all about mackerel. Some people yeah. really love it. I do. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people don't, but yeah. I think it's tasty. But I'm not alone, apparently. No, you're not alone. <laughs> I've had it as well. And have a look at this video again sent to us from uh, Grant Cudmore. And just beautiful, beautiful That's footage here. Gorgeous. Yeah, what you're seeing is a pod of Atlantic white sided dolphins feasting on a school of mackerel. So, hey, yeah. They like, it. lay like it. Kings Point near wow. Green Bay. This comes, that was just a couple of week, weeks ago, apparently. I don't you just love that drone footage? Yeah, spectacular. Yeah. It's interesting, they're eating it, and yeah. we were talking in the commercial. A lot of Newfoundlanders just use no, mackerel it's, it's bait. bait. It's bait. Yeah, well, why eat mackerel like if you can get lobster and crab? <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. I like it too, though. I've had it as well, and uh, yeah, it's pretty tasty. Uh, so, you know, we're 30 minutes into the show. Yeah. You haven't run away yet. You're no, still no, here. No, I'm still here. Thank so, you. Are you telling welcome. me something? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. welcome I to the show officially. That. Yeah. I was yeah. reading the contract, and I, there's a section there that talked about an audition, and then I read the fine print, and it actually says probation. So hopefully <laughs> I'll last the week and see what happens. Well, you're, again, 30 minutes in, so you're doing pretty well. Oh, good. Uh, well no hooks? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. There was a backup plan. Uh, I pushed you aside and just read the rest. Uh, but uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Anthony. Thank and uh, Thank you. perfect to. Uh, uh, to uh, start with the winter season as we'll, uh, we'll be able to uh, talk about hockey and of course snowfall. Uh, have a look at uh, just this uh, wonderful shot here that was taken and it really is a sign of the times. This is the Labrador Highway today between Red Bay and Mary's Harbor and it certainly is a sign of the times as we walk over to our green wall and I'm just not there mentally to be prepared to drive in conditions like this. Not there yet. I don't know about you. Uh, I do have snow tires on one vehicle though, uh, so we're getting there slowly but surely. More showers Tuesday and Wednesday across the island. We're going to actually uh, show uh, a chance of seeing some flurries in the mix uh, tonight into tomorrow along the northern peninsula, uh, but clearing out quite nicely across Labrador, but more flurries in the mix for Wednesday for you folks. Temperatures staying cool. Uh, yeah, very fall like certainly and more snow on the go into Labrador as I mentioned Wednesday. And then again, later in the week. Have a look at highs today. 19 and actually 20 degrees in Gander for this afternoon. A far cry from where we are right now as that cold front has ripped through. Six degrees in Gander, 15 in St. John. So we're hanging onto the warm air here and across the Avalon in the southeast. But it's being squeezed out pretty quickly thanks to those northwest winds which are really driving in. In fact, winds have shifted west now in St. John's. Northwesterly winds across Labrador as well. Current wind gusts just shy of 60 in St. John's and across the Bonavista Peninsula and 65 in Twillingate. So it is definitely very gusty on the other side of this system, which is moving offshore, colder air in behind. And so a brief clear out and very brief because we've got this low, which is brewing along the cold front and that will, it'll be moving southeast of the island through tomorrow, but close enough uh, that it will be bringing some showers, especially to the Avalon and the Buren Peninsulas. Scattered shower chances into central Newfoundland and especially the west coast into the morning hours. Labrador looks pretty good through the day tomorrow. Just watching for some late day flurries starting to work their way into places like Labrador City and then eventually Churchill Falls through the afternoon. This system will then spread into Labrador through Tuesday night and then across the island through Wednesday with more shower chances and again some flurry chances in the higher elevations of the Long Range Mountains. Overnight lows tonight near 5 for St. John's in the Marystown region down towards the Buren Peninsula. Uh, we'll be closer to the freezing mark for Central, uh, though likely just above with that cloud cover. 3 in Cornerbrook and below freezing in Labrador. Minus 7 to start the day in Labrador City. In St. John's, uh, where we start is pretty much where we stay. Five, six degrees. Yeah, thank those northeasterly winds, which are going to be coming right in off the Atlantic, gusting 30 to 40, just keeping it raw feeling, especially with those showers in the mix. So uh, not necessarily a warm coat unless it's waterproof. Uh, perhaps a hoodie with a, with a rain jacket over top is going to be the name of the game. St. John's, Bonavista, Clarenville, where we'll see our best shower chances tomorrow. It will be over the southeast. A little brighter uh, with some sun chances for Central. 
the west coast. Uh, any sun will be appearing into the afternoon as the system starts to move offshore and further to the east. In Labrador, beautiful day, uh, especially for this time of year, four to six degrees with just a chance of some flurries in the west with temperatures closer to the freezing mark. We'll walk you through that long range forecast right through the weekend in just a few minutes. Debbie. Well, it was a heartwarming but difficult weekend for Andrea Goss, who attended the opening of a second playground in her daughter's memory. Goss's daughter, Quinn Butt, was five when she was found dead in her father's Carboneer home. Trent Butt has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder and arson charges. Now, a playground dedicated to Quinn stands in the community where she lived. Anyone who knew Quinn knew how much she loved playing there with her friends. She was quite a social butterfly, our pussycat. But this is another bittersweet day for sure. While I love being involved in everything we do to keep Quinn's memory alive, and while Quinn's place is the perfect way to honor her legacy, the fact remains that we are all here today because she is not. And that will never be an easy thing to come to terms with. But as always, we will smile and push forward to celebrate her in a big way because that's what she would want us to do. Oh, we were very proud to unveil the new Quinn's Place Playground. Um, I think it's going to be a long-standing tribute to Quinn, but and also any other woman or child who's ever had domestic violence in their lives. Um, as I said um, before, it's, it's very bittersweet because... Um, you know, it's so nice to see another legacy in Quinn's name, but at the same time, all of this is here because she isn't. Um, but we have to push on and do things that we know that would make her happy and that what she would want us to do. Um, and in Carboneer is, is special for us. A lot of her friends are from here and live here and um, live very close to this playground in walking distance, and they can come here daily and remember her and know that that it's there for her so um it's really um it's really heartwarming too to know that to see everybody here all our friends and family and quinn's friends here to support us and um i think she would be ecstatic here today and um she's very happy that this is all for her i can tell you that <laughs> Well, I remember when you interviewed uh, Quinn's and, mom. Yeah, and Andrea it was, Goss. Yeah, yeah, it was very difficult, but it's, it's something to see, even this horrific yeah. tragedy, that's something that other kids can actually play on and enjoy in her name. It's, uh, it's she such keeps, a monument almost. She keeps Quinn close to her all the time. She's always in her mind, and uh, she's moving forward, and other children are going to benefit. Yeah. It's great to see. It's true. Up next, we'll tell you about the Me Too campaign and explain why it is getting a lot of attention.
Welcome back. Well, the topic of sexual assault and harassment is making headlines since the Harvey Weinstein scandal exploded. It may in part explain why the Provincial Sexual Assault Crisis Center is experiencing a greater demand than ever before. And the Me Too Facebook campaign started because of Weinstein's revelations makes this plea. If all the women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Well, I'm joined now in the studio by actress and filmmaker Ruth Lawrence and uh, Rick Page, a self-proclaimed feminist who has been involved in education programs in schools about gender equality. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. The Me Too campaign, as I said, has exploded. Thousands and thousands of posts from everywhere. Ruth, what do you make of it? Well, I think it's interesting because uh, until it was Weinstein, I think people probably didn't feel that they could speak out. As it turns out, he's a very powerful man. But the women who are speaking out are women who we've invited into our lives. They, they've portrayed empathetic characters that we f feel close to them, and so we believe them. And I think that's what makes this case different from other cases that have gotten lots of media attention that people just don't tend to believe women. And Rick, your th initial thoughts on this, what is happening in social media right now? It's it's been going on for a long time. It's it's what uh, has the, the problem. The the, the problem. The uh, and basically, men aren't taking responsibility for their actions. And uh, when when I was going into schools, working with Iris Kirby House on a, a program, going in to talk to uh, uh, young teenagers, junior high students mostly, the the boys were incredibly ignorant and incredible ignorant of the issue, and incredibly insensitive to what their female co students were saying. And you know, this is a long time ago, and oh yet yeah. we're discussing it here today. It was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. if not more. Yeah. 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 It's a social problem, really. I mean, that's the problem, is that it's a social, so we're socialized to think that it's acceptable, and that's why it can go on for so long. And somehow this group think happens that, uh, you know, be, be more, more and more people know about it, but yet they feel like, well, why should I speak up? That person didn't. And I think that's part of what's happening. Well, one of the uh, posts I looked at today says, um, used to feel too embarrassed to admit this bleep. Uh, so I can totally understand why people wouldn't come forward. Mm -hmm. But it's not my, our fault. I, we didn't do anything wrong. Has the conversation genuinely started now that might promote some change? Well, one would hope so. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a men's issue unless men start speaking out to other men and saying to them, this is not acceptable, you've got to change, nothing's going to change. Now, Ruth, you work in an environment that's uh, theater, film, television. The Weinstein case came out of that mm -hmm. uh, particular um, career. Do you see that here in our province in that industry? I have to say I feel very lucky because I haven't experienced it. Now, I don't often work as a as a woman acting in the film industry. I'm actually more often the writer, director, or producer. And so I think that actually changes circumstances Because you have a the little. power? Yeah, I think that's the, the difference. And that's when you look at that case, uh, it's about powerless people, people who have not yet made it to the top, and it's not until they get to the top that they feel that they do have the freedom to speak out. So now, that's that's why I think part of the problem is. Now you posted Me Too. Would you share what you experienced? Well, I experienced it mostly, not within the industry, actually. I, I give credit to all my coworkers. I, I mostly experienced it on a societal sort of social level that's where i really encountered sexual harassment and abuse really and so uh, i do feel lucky because I, I it was at a time when i wasn't really prepared to say much about it but i i'm a survivor and i've learned how to deal with it and now it doesn't happen and i think it's because somehow or another i have an awareness and i feel strong enough that I, that i'm i'm able to cope with it sort of as soon as it starts, you know. Now, Rick, to your earlier point that it is a men's problem, another post said, uh, this woman said, so bored of women bearing this brunt. Shift the focus away from victims and uh, toward the aggressors. So obviously, she has a point in your view. So how do we get there, Rick? 
oh, education programs have to, education programs and men taking responsibility in the locker rooms, uh, when we're talking to each other in the bars, we have to, we have to take responsibility for ourselves and for the other men in, that, we are, that we know. Otherwise, if men can get away with it, they'll get away with it. You uh, told me earlier that you have a son who's a musician. He's out in the west coast of the country. And he has spoken with you about this issue. You uh, obviously spoke about this at home. But what was it he says to you about what he sees? <laughs> so, so, but Ian grew up in a, in a house with two feminists, <laughs> his mother and his father. So uh, I remember his friends saying to me that at any point that any misogynist conversation or homophobic conversation came up in their group, Ian would take them right on, would take everybody right on. And so he says that he still does that. He does that in the bars. If he sees it happening, he, he will talk to people about it. So women are feeling empowered by this Me Too campaign, for sure. So we have to make men feel empowered to stand up to bullies. Yeah. Men. That's right, exactly. And that's and I think that's part of the solution too is that we have to support the people who come out and speak out. I mean, often the, the reason that people don't feel empowered or feel like they can't speak out is because they feel like they're very vulnerable and they are. So we have to find a way to support them not just one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but also societally, I think, you know, like we have to make the changes that are going to actually mean that those people aren't punished and that they don't lose out because they've spoken up. A big conversation. Uh, thank you for uh, chatting with me for a little while, Ruth Lawrence and Rick Page. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Ruth. Some people call the Cape to Heaven race the hardest road race in North America, but for one woman, she made it look easy. She's just 79. I'm Jeremy Nod. That story coming up. Time to introduce our young athlete of today uh, of the day, and today it's five-year-old Kai Miller of St. John's. 
Uh, this summer, Kai played with the St. John's Minor Baseball Association on the Rally Caps Cardinals team. He plays left-handed and he loves hitting the ball hard enough, and who doesn't, for it to actually hit the grass. <laughs> Congratulations, you're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Nice. It's adorable. So, adorable. <laughs> so nice to see the little ones like that, and so nice to see summer. Yeah, but it is true. fleeting. Yes, <laughs> uh, memories. Yeah, no doubt. We had some winds, some high ones today, a little bit of rain in St. John's in the last 12 hours, but nothing like they're seeing in the Emerald Isle. No, yeah, it's a, a wicked, wicked storm, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and unfortunately, a deadly storm at that. Uh, we've had uh, Hurricane Ophelia the remnants of that storm it's actually post tropical now actually ripping the roofs off wow. of homes uh trees have fallen on cars and again Whoa. sadly three people have been killed in separate accidents tonight over 300,000 homes and businesses without power in the irish republic northern ireland ireland and wales wow. yeah some dramatic footage there when you see roofs flying off houses yeah big big storm and again uh, pretty unprecedented to see you know uh, a storm of that magnitude rolling into that neck of yeah. the woods uh, mm -hmm. this time of year again they get some powerful winter storms but post tropical storms that are this strong and have a look at some of the winds again uh, we're talking about gusts here upwards of 192 kilometers per hour now this is unofficial but that's at a private weather station along the south coast uh, Dublin 100 kilometer per hour gusts there so pretty strong winds again for this time of year when the trees are still full and lush and they really grab those kind of winds and that's when we see that type of damage there's the storm there again we'll continue to spin up towards Scotland tonight uh, our own separate system, which is bringing some gusty winds, nothing like that, is going to be departing over the next uh, 12 hours or so. Quickly follow it up, though, with a low that's going to be moving southeast of the island tonight. Quickly, though, bringing in some showers by the time we get to tomorrow morning. There's your cold front. Tuesday morning, showers moving back over the Avalon and the Buren Peninsulas. It's a quiet start in Labrador, but note the clouds that do build in as we roll through the later parts of the day, and we will see some snow into the afternoon for Labrador City. The island clearing out shower chances even into the afternoon, but generally the theme here is cool. Six, seven, eight degrees across the uh, board tomorrow. Northeasterly winds gusting around 40 to 50 kilometers per hour. Labrador, some sun and cloud on the menu. Temperatures into those low single digits. But again, that snow rolling into the west into the later parts of the day. By Wednesday morning, that low moving into western parts of Newfoundland with some showers that pushes across the island through the day on Wednesday with showers into the afternoon and evening hours. By the time we get to uh, yeah Wednesday evening, it's moving into the Avalon. Should see some sun breaks though in the morning for the Avalon and the Buren if you have some Wednesday morning plans. Uh, again, cloudy with better chance of showers in the by midday for central and pretty much from start to finish along the west coast. Uh, again, higher elevation snow definitely looking likely for uh, you folks in Labrador. Could even see some wet flurries mixing in along parts of the coast and Cartwright, Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City looking likely to see some wet flakes from this one as well. So by the time we get to Wednesday evening, that system starts to depart the nicest day of the week. Looks to be Thursday. Uh, we'll see a nice area of high pressure to our south. Southerly flow moving in and pretty nice day overall. Certainly clouding up for you folks in Lab West with some showers working in there. But we're back into the double digits across the island. 10, 11, even 12 degrees under a mix of sun and cloud. Overall, a pretty nice one indeed. Temperatures will actually warm as we roll into Friday, but our next system approaches. Uh, Again, it's uh, hand in hand this time of year when you get a warm blast, you often get some clouds and then showers approaching, which we will have through the day on Friday. First into the west, late day into the east. Saturday, the big cool down, and then we're again recovering as we roll through the latter half of the weekend into Monday. So it's the roller coaster ride of temperatures this time of year, and that's what we'll be seeing over the next seven. Into Labrador, again, low single digit temps in, uh, for Wednesday, Thursday into Friday. Uh, that next system rolls in with some flurry chances lingering into Saturday and kind of riding that seasonal mark through the weekend. That's your forecast. We'll have a, your viewer photo of the day coming up in just a few minutes. I'm feeling a little stiff today, Debbie. It was the <laughs> 11th running of the grueling Cape to Cabot road race over the weekend. You did not. Yeah, did <laughs> I get tired driving from Cape Spear <laughs> to Signal Hill. More than 500 mm. people laced up to tackle the challenging course, starting, of course, at one historic site and finishing in another. It is an amazing race. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the runners was Florence Barron. We introduced you to her last year or last week. And at the age of 79, I'm thinking years here, uh, <laughs> she ran the race for the fifth time and managed to post 
her fastest time Incredible. yet. Here now is Jeremy Eden tried to catch up to her during the race. It's a challenging uh, race, uh, you know, to run from the most easterly point in uh, North America to uh, the top of Signal Hill, both uh, National Historic Sites. Uh, it, it appeals to uh, a large number of, of people. And, and it is an accomplishment. Uh, anybody that does this race certainly has a lot to be proud of. Yeah, there's a number of uh, downhills uh, and a number of, uh, of significant climbs. Uh, Signal Hill being the, uh, the, the longest climb. Gosh, I don't know. I think because I train all summer and I know I am, you know, I know I can do it and I can do it without any problems. So, you know, yeah, just, just out with the crowd and enjoying the, the friends. ran uh, just over two hours and six minutes, which I yes, understand is yes. a personal best. Uh, yes. Did you plan on going that fast? No, no, no I, I, didn't, I didn't really mind at all. I was just going to do it for the love of it, that's all. Yeah, for the hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a delight running with you. <laughs> and if I inspire people, well, that's wonderful. You know, if I motivate them, that's a good thing. And maybe more people will want to get out and, and try it. Carol! <laughs> I attribute it to having good genes, and uh, and I always say if I have good genes, I guess I might as well use them to the good. I won't let you walk. Oh my goodness! Those are great genes. Yeah, <laughs> it's remarkable. I mean, she's isn't running. It? I'd be running that fast going downhill <laughs> compared to what she was doing uphill. The last part up to Signal Hill. You've got wow. another year to train, though. Yeah, I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> Our gorgeous viewer picture of the day is just that and it is taken somewhere on the island the west coast uh, i'll let you know where after the break All right, welcome back to the show. Our viewer picture of the day is a beauty, and it was taken in Western Newfoundland. And Anthony Germain, in his first show, answered this correctly. <laughs> what do I win? 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, you get to come back That's again. That's excellent. I'll, <laughs> take, I'll take it. Nice. <laughs> what a beauty. Yeah. Randy Alexander is a frequent contributor to some of our most beautiful pictures we see, and this is uh, no different. No wonder. Wow. Yeah. Keep them coming, Randy. That is another gorgeous shot. Anytime Absolutely. you see the northern lights that far south, the big wow. one. Wow, yeah. so green. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, managed to survive so far. Yeah, great <laughs> job. We try and do this again tomorrow? We definitely will. Okay. Thanks to all of you for being here. Have a great night, and join us all back here again tomorrow. Good night. Good night.